All right, perfect. We're all set up. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Gut Microbiome in Serious Mental Illness. I would like to remind you all that if there's time, we will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. So if you're attending through Zoom, please ask any question in the chat box or the question and answer portion. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment. Our presenter today is Dr. Tanya Wen. Dr. Tanya Wen is an assistant professor of psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego. She's a clinical neuropsychologist with expertise in the assessment and treatment of older adults with neuropsychiatric disorders. Dr. Wen is research faculty within the Stein Institute for Research on Aging at UCSD, where she is actively involved in clinical research. She has been the principal investigator on several national institutes of health, as well as national and local foundation grants. Broadly, her research aims to identify mechanisms, cognitive and biological aging and mental illnesses. Her current work is focused on the gut-brain axis and understanding the relationship between the gut microbiome, brain and behavior, particularly as it pertains to mental illness and aging. Dr. Wen is the Principal Investigator of National Institute of Mental Health Career Development Award to investigate the role of the gut microbiome in accelerated aging and schizophrenia and how imbalance of the gut ecosystem can alter immune responses, leading to alterations to brain and behavioral function. Thank you, for, um, thank you so much for joining us today and presenting your research. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for that very nice introduction, and thank you everyone for attending. I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit more about my research and the general research in this area on the microbiota gut-brain axis in bipolar disorder and other psychiatric illnesses. Um, so this is a, an outline of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll start off by describing the human microbiome, including our methods for studying it and its role in general human health and disease. Um, I think there's not a lot known about it and a lot of people are interested. So I'll begin with a, a general introduction to the area. And then I'll go into the gut-brain axis a little bit more um, and the mechanisms by which the microbiome and the brain communicate. And then finally, I'll present our current knowledge on the gut microbiome in various clinical populations um, with psychiatric disorders and in bipolar disorder. Uh, so let's start off with some definitions. A microbiota is any assemblage of microorganisms in a defined environment. So this would include bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and viruses. A metagenome is all of the genetic material that are contained within that community of organisms. And the microbiome refers to that in entire habitat, including the microorganisms, their genes, and the surrounding environmental conditions. I know a lot of times these terms are used interchangeably, so it's nice to define them so that everyone has a, a broad understanding of what they mean specifically. Um, and microbes live on almost every habitat on Earth, as well as other living organisms. So any habitat that contains microbes can be considered a microbiome. Of course, the human microbiome has attracted immense scientific attention from the medical research community within the last decade. And this figure here depicts the various microbial environments from which um, uh, data has was collected as part of the Earth Microbiome Project. Um, and these are obtained from um, environments associated with hosts, such as on plants or animals, and this would include the human microbiome, um, but also free living environments, such as the natural environment, environment the oceans, um, deserts, and so forth. And just as different parts of the world have different landscapes of organisms, such as plants and animals that are uniquely characteristic of that place, different parts of our bodies have distinct communities of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And these microbes on our bodies make us who we are. Let's use some numbers as examples. Each of us consists of about 30 trillion human cells but we harbor as many as 39 trillion microbial cells. 
So when you look at yourself in the mirror every morning, you see an organism that's only 43% human. But we're more than just cells. Part of what makes us human is our DNA. The human genome contains 20,000 genes, but our bacteria harbor anywhere from two to 20 million genes. So the bacterial genome dwarfs the human genome by about 100 to one. So any way you look at it, we are more microbial than human. And when we think of therapies, which up until the last decade or so, have been focused on modifying genetic factors, we have been neglecting about 99% of the genes present on our bodies. There is incredible diversity of microbes on our body. What you're seeing here is a map of the human body based on different microbiomes. Each point on this map represents all of the complexity in a microbial community distilled down into just one point. Points that are closer together are more similar in composition, while points that are further apart are more different in composition. If we color code each point based on where in the body the sample was taken, you can see that the composition of microbes at each body site is drastically different from one another and tend to cluster together, suggesting that there's a, a unique profile or composition associated with different microbiomes across our body. Then if we take what's known from the Earth Microbiome Project and the Human Microbiome Project, and if we compare the microbial environment in our mouths to the coral reefs in Australia, for example, then the microbial environment in our guts would be as different as the savannas in Africa. So it's really incredible to think that the microbiomes on our body, separated by just a few feet, can be as different as ecosystems thousands of miles apart. And of the many distinct environments inhabited by microbes on our bodies, the gut has the greatest microbial biomass, with over a thousand different bacterial species. And these microbes have different kinds of functions. Everything from digesting our food, metabolizing drugs, to regulating our immune system. And we now know that they have involvement in different kinds of diseases. So let's backtrack a little bit. And I wanna talk about where our microbes originated in the first place. And this is important to understanding microbial dysfunction that may be associated with different diseases. The human microbiome is established at birth and develops in the first few years of life. Immediately at and following birth, environmental factors begin to dictate the colonization of specific microbes that will occur. So in this figure, each point corresponds to a community colored according to either the mother's body site or the newborn um, delivery mode. So infants who were delivered vaginally acquired microbiomes that resemble their mother's vaginal bacteria, whereas infants delivered by C-section harbored bacteria more similar to those found on their mother's skin surface. The microbiome of a newborn infant born via vaginal birth is most similar to that of an adult micro vaginal microbiome. And as the infant grows and develops, we can track its migration of the microbiome as it becomes more similar to the adult gut microbiome over time. The infant microbiome is relatively volatile. Dramatic changes occur over the first three years of life with this increase in diversity and stability. And at those earliest stages, the microbiome is particularly sensitive to environmental factors ranging from everything such as mode of delivery, antibiotics, type of feeding from breast um, bottle or formula, um, introduction of foods, medications, and exposure to different types of infections or stress. And all of these things have been shown to play a role in determining the composition of the gut. And research is starting to look at how these early life factors can affect susceptibility to immunological diseases in later life, though this is not fully understood quite yet. 
And so the maturation of the microbiome throughout the lifespan is a great example of ecological succession. So following initial, initial colonization at birth, there's this dramatic increase in diversity and richness until the microbiome reaches its highest complexity in the adult. And then again, at later stages, we see this decrease in diversity um, and increase in volatility again with aging. And it's worth noting that this seeding of our microbiome occurs in parallel with growth and maturation of neurons in the young brain. And again, in old age, a decline of diversity occurs in parallel with a decrease in neuronal complexity. So what's a healthy microbiome? Um, it's complicated. And I think a lot of research is trying to understand this, um, but it's a complicated question and answer. And the best way to describe it is that the gut microbiome is a complex ecosystem. And optimal, fu optimal functioning of this ecosystem requires equilibrium. Um, the term ecological balance describes how ecosystems are organized in a state of stability, where species coexist with one another and with their environment. So if we draw parallels between the human microbiome and other macroecological systems, such as a rainforest or a coral reef, if you eliminate one particular plant or animal species, it can radically alter the overall state or ecology of that rainforest or marine habitat. So all species are very important and help keep this ecosystem balanced. So calling one or two microorganisms as either good or bad can often be oversimplistic. And a prime example of this is Clostridium difficile infection. Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, um, infection is caused by overgrowth of this bacteria that can cause symptoms ranging from diarrhea to life-threatening inflammation of the colon. And this type of infection usually occurs after long-term use of antibiotics. These repeated exposure to these drugs, especially in people who are older or immune compromised, tends to destroy normal helpful bacteria, so to speak, in addition to bacteria that's causing the infection. And without enough mutualistic bacteria to keep it in check, C. diff can grow quickly out of control. So C. diff in this scenario is clearly a quote, bad bacteria. Um, but again, I like to think about it in ecological terms and in terms of symbiotic relationships amongst organisms. C. diff is parasitic to the human body because it creates toxins that attack the lining of the intestine. But other bacteria have mutualistic relationships with their human hosts in which both partners benefit or commensalistic relationships in which one benefits and another is neither harmed nor helped. So again, this concept of this idealized set of bacteria that's considered healthy is overly simplistic. People differ enormously in the taxonomic content of their microbiomes. Even the same person over time can appear dramatically different from their prior representation. Functional redundancy also makes characterization of a healthy microbiome extremely complex. Functional redundancy is a concept that different species are essentially interchangeable so that different profiles of the microbiome lead to the same function. And this is something that over evolution is quite adaptive. If the microbiome changes often, what's more important is not just who's there, but the role that they play in determining health. Additionally, it's also unclear whether normal implies healthy, because optimal health might be very context dependent, both at the population and individual level. So what's healthy and normal for me might not be normal and healthy for you or people living in different environments or cultures. So from an ecological standpoint, the stability of any community, bacterial or otherwise, can be considered a function of the health of that community. So stability refers to three different types of things. It's ability to resist change in the setting of an ecologic stress, or resistance. 
its ability to return to equilibrium following a stress-related disruption, also known as resilience, or its ability to recover initial function despite changes in composition. Um, and this is the concept of functional redundancy that I mentioned earlier. So these three properties are generally exhibited by robust microbiomes. And it's a complex issue to actually determine what makes a microbiome robust. But generally, the term dysbiosis is used to describe a breach in robustness and a transition to a new state that's perhaps less stable and tends to be associated with disease. Uh, the lack of sufficient diversity or evenness in a microbiome appears to diminish its ability to withstand disruption or perturbation. And sometimes in the field, this term is also referred to as alpha diversity. Many diseases such as obesity and inflammatory bowel disease are associated with reduced microbiome diversity, which may represent a suboptimal environment. It's still unclear whether low alpha diversity necessarily leads to disease. It's possible that people with low alpha diversity may not have overt disease in most environments, but their microbiomes may be less than optimal for preventing disease. So that kind of transitions us a little bit into how these microbes influence health and disease. As humans, we've co-evolved with and participate in a very intimate symbiotic relationship with our microbiomes. Our microbiome regulates many metabolic processes essential for health that can't be maintained by our own cells. For example, our microbiomes play an important role in helping us develop our immune system. It stabilizes our gut barrier and helps defend against pathogens and infections. It helps us obtain nutrients from food sources that would otherwise be indigestible, such as plants. And the gut is also a primary source for neurotransmitters used in our brains and associated with different psychiatric disorders. The microbiome in the gut has been shown to be associated with virtually all major classes of disease. Gastrointestinal or digestive diseases would appear most obvious, but it's also associated with obesity and metabolic disorders, various types of cancers, not just colon as indicated here, pulmonary diseases like asthma, cystic fibrosis, and COPD, and a number of neurologic and psychiatric disorders, which I will discuss a little bit later. And the conditions associated with gut dysbiosis are remarkably similar to those associated with aging and inflammation, suggesting that the microbiome may play a key role in age-related inflammation. And I will come back to this again a little bit later when discussing the role of the microbiome in psychiatric disorders and bipolar disorders specifically. But first I want to touch upon some studies that have demonstrated the degree to which the microbiome impacts health and disease. In order to study this, um, no, no biotic, notobiotic, excuse me, mice or germ-free animals have been critical for allowing us to directly assess the microbiome's impact on health outcomes. These particular mice are born and bred in such a way that they're never exposed to bacteria. And these mice give us the opportunity to compare germ-free subjects with normally raised ones to see how the presence or absence of bacteria can influence outcomes. And we can then introduce specific microorganisms or specific gut microbiomes at a time and examine how these influence behavior and health and establish causality. So for example, to test a microbiome model of obesity and metabolic syndrome, previous studies have looked at conventional and germ-free mice. And if you feed both of these mice a high fat diet, the conventional mouse becomes obese as expected. And it also shows metabolic alterations that are associated with obesity, such as insulin resistance, intestinal permeability, an increase in adipose or fat tissue. 
On the other hand, the germ-free mice doesn't show any of these changes and gains minimal weight. Then if you transfer the fecal matter of this obese conventional mouse into the germ-free mouse, the result is you get an obese mouse with all of the same metabolic alterations. So this study suggests that the microbiome is at least necessary for our diets to impact phenotype. Similar studies have also been done across species. So this study that was published in Science looked at these germ-free mice and they transplanted these mice with the fecal microbiomes of two twins, human twins, I should say, that were discordant for obesity. Transplantation from the obese twin led to mice that were obese with increases in body mass and fat tissue. Whereas transplantation from the lean twin led to lean mice. So again, this study showed that fat tissue or adiposity is transmissible from humans to mice through the microbiome. And these changes that we see were also reflected in blood levels of branch chain amino acid, which have also been linked to insulin resistance, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So how is this all relevant now to neurological or mental health? The gut microbiota is part of a complex network termed the gut-brain axis, which involves bidirectional signaling between the central nervous system and the gastrointestinal system. This whole network not only ensures proper maintenance of gastrointestinal homeostasis, such as mobility, nutrient delivery, and microbial balance within the gut, but it also links the gut with emotional and cognitive centers of the brain with peripheral intestinal functions. The gut-brain axis includes multiple different systems, including the brain and spinal cord of the central nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the enteric nervous system, which I'll talk about in a second, and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis. So much is often talked about the autonomic and central nervous systems as well as the HPA axis within the context of psychiatric disorders. However, the enteric nervous system is less often considered, but really this is like our second brain, so to speak. The ENS is a network of about 500 million neurons that are embedded in the lining of our gastrointestinal system. And it helps moderate gastrointestinal function. The microbiota in our gut interacts locally with our intestinal cells and with these enteric neurons. And there are multiple direct and indirect pathways through which the microbiome can impact the gut-brain axis. So in this figure here, the blue arrows represent afferent effects. So how the gut influences the brain. So you can think of it as bottom up. And then the red arrow represents the top-down effect from the brain to the gut. In this first pathway here, the microbiome may alter tight junction integrity and the permeability of that intestinal barrier, causing microbes to pass from the gut into systemic circulation, a process known as translocation. Then we have lymphocytes or immune cells within circulation that detect these gut microbes and release cytokines because essentially it's seeing these microbes as invaders. And these cytokines are pro-inflammatory and can have both systemic and directly pass through the central nervous system through the blood brain barrier. A second way is through sensory neurons or sensory neurons such as the vagus nerve, which can be activated by gut peptides and cells in our um, enteroendocrine system. Um, we know that activation of the vagus nerve can have anti-inflammatory capacities. And in fact, vagus nerve stimulation has been considered a treatment for some treatment resistant disorders such as depression and also in bipolar disorder. So that's another mechanism through this pathway where our microbiomes can impact 
cognitive and emotional functioning. Specific bacteria in our microbiomes are capable of synthesizing a wide range of neurometabolites, including neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine, as well as neurotrophic factors, such as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Then within the brain, we have a neural network that has been implicated involving the amygdala, hypothalamus, and insular cortex that has been consistently shown to be the main integrators of our visceral inputs. Not shown here, but also important to mention are short chain fatty acids, which are produced from bacterial fermentation of fiber. And these can pass both the gut and brain barriers to modulate brain and behavior. The main efferent effects of this system, so top down from the brain to the gut, involves the HPA axis. Corticosteroids released as a result of HPA activation modulates the gut brain, I'm sorry, the gut microbiome composition. And then finally, sympathetic or parasympathetic signals from the brain can influence the functioning of the gut. So motility, permeability, and biofilm production. And my, my best example for that is imagine when you get really nervous or very anxious. You'll notice that sometimes people have gastrointestinal symptoms, such as constipation or bowel movements or lack of appetite. So similar to medical disorders, some of the first studies that directly assess the microbiome's impact on different aspects of behaviors relevant to psychiatric disorders were done in these notobiotic or germ-free mice. And compared to conventional animals, these germ-free mice generally show decreased depression or anxiety-like behaviors. If you transplant these germ-free mice with the fecal microbiomes of patients with major depressive disorder, you see an increase in behaviors associated with de depression such a compared to transplantation of fecal matter from healthy participants. So these graphs over here show some of these data where these mice have greater periods of immobility and less time in the center of an open field test or a forced swim test. So these findings suggest that the microbiome to some extent is necessary for some psychiatric or behavioral functions and that there may be a unique signature, composition, or functionality that's associated with different disorders compared to health. Other studies have linked the gut microbiome with neurodevelopmental and neurodegenerative disorders. And I'll just briefly summarize the findings of these papers. But in this first study, they used a what we call maternal immune activation model for autism spectrum disorders. And they found that these affected mice show alterations in the microbiome in addition to other gut barrier defects, along with abnormal inflammatory profiles. Then if these mice were treated with a probiotic bacterium, all of the physiological, neurological, and metabolic abnormalities were reversed. So these findings were one of the first to suggest that leaky gut and then related elevations in pro-inflammatory cytokines may be potential mechanisms by which the microbiome disrupts behavioral functioning. Another study that was conducted um, in Parkinson's disease, they used a mouse model that overexpresses over alpha-synuclein, which is a neuropathological protein relevant to Parkinson's disease. So in this middle panel, Germ-free strains of these animals do not display any abnormalities, either motor deficits or alpha-synuclein pathology characteristic of Parkinson's disease. However, if you colonize these mice with fecal matter from healthy human donors, you start to see some of these alpha-synuclein pathology and motor dysfunction which is mediated by short chain fatty acid metabolites that modulate neuroinflammation in the brain. Further, if you colonize these germ-free mice 
with the fecal matter from patients with Parkinson's disease, you get an even enhanced response where you have motor dysfunction alongside with neuropathological and neuroinflammation. So again, this study suggests that the gut's necessary for behavioral deficits associated with some neurodegenerative features, and that mechanism likely involves inflammatory processes. So all the studies that I've mentioned up until this point have primarily been done in animal studies because we have a greater degree of control in manipulating different factors. But much less is known about the gut microbiome in human clinical populations, although that number of studies is rapidly growing. So to start out, I will go over a little bit of background on bipolar disorder. Most of you probably already know all about this, but bipolar disorder is a chronic psychiatric disorder characterized by the presence of one or more manic or mixed episodes. And although it's mostly known for its mood polarities, bipolar disorder is also associated with high rates of medical illness. There's a wide range of medical problems that have been cited in people with bipolar disorder, with the most common being cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity, alongside with other digestive problems, which is why I wanted to highlight some of these medical studies done with regards to the microbiome. A high medical illness burden is associated with worse psychiatric prognosis and outcomes, including rapid cycling of mood episode, longer duration of lifetime depression, suicide attempts, and mood episodes with more acute onset. And this interaction between medical burden and psychiatric symptoms lead to worse treatment outcomes and lower quality of life, and even premature mortality. So a specific research question that my current work is focused on is the topic of accelerated biological aging in mental illness and how it impacts physical, mental, and cognitive health in these individuals. Compared to the general population, people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder have higher rates of these chronic medical conditions and die younger. Younger adults with serious mental illnesses are more prone to diseases associated with aging at earlier ages and have twice the risk of dying from cardiovascular and gastrointestinal disorders compared to the general population. A number of mechanisms have been proposed for how or why accelerated aging may occur. These include inflammation, oxidative stress, cellular aging, and diminished uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. And one mechanism that stands out is inflammation. Earlier, I mentioned the parallels between conditions associated with gut dysbiosis and those associated with aging and inflammation. So our hypothesis is that perhaps the microbiome may be a mechanism that drives some of these changes and contributes to accelerated aging and mental illness. Over the last two decades, it's been shown that inflammatory processes and neural immune interactions are involved in the pathophysiology of bipolar disorder and major depressive disorders. We see elevated levels of circulating T cells, pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as increased microglia activation in the brain. It's been hypothesized that long-term dysregulation of the immune system may contribute to neural progression that's often observed in late stage bipolar disorder. Neuroprogression is a term that refers to this acceleration of disease process, so that as individuals age and the longer they've been ill, their illness is now characterized by shorter remission periods, um, along with more progressive changes in brain structural and cognitive alterations. However, although we have evidence that neuroprogression may exist, the causes are not quite clear, although perhaps chronic inflammation may be one of those mechanisms. So we know that the GI system plays a vital role in digestion, liquid retention, and waste excretion. 
And the integrity of the lining or the epithelium is essential for proper functioning of the digestive tract. It restricts the passage of microorganisms from the innermost internal region of the intestine into systemic or blood circulation. So when the balance of the gastrointestinal system is compromised due to diseases, the lipid membrane and tight junction of this epithelium can be disrupted, leading to increased permeability and microbial translocation, which I had mentioned earlier. This translocation can trigger an inflammatory reaction in response to kind of pathogens that pass into the bloodstream. Gastroenterologists commonly use the translocation markers as a diagnostic tool in gastrointestinal disorders, such as irritable bowel syndrome and irritable um, inflammatory bowel diseases. So for example, Crohn's disease is detected by antibodies to a yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae that's usually found in the gut. Um, our knowledge of how the gut impacts brain and behavior has actually been known for quite some time. Uh, there have been writings as early as the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, that suggest that the contents of the colon could potentially contribute to melancho melancholia or neuroses. And some of these terms were referred to as auto-intoxication or intestinal toxemia back in the day. Uh, and one of the earliest reports um, showing a relationship between gastrointestinal function and bipolar disorder um, was a series of case reports by G.W. Henry in 1931 who identified disturbances in gut motility in patients who at that time had manic depressive disorders. Um, and more recently, epidemiological evidence has found an increased prevalence of gastrointestinal disorders in mood, anxiety, and psychotic disorders, ranging from 50% to as high as 90%. Research studies have shown that um, blood-based biomarkers of microbial translocation are elevated in people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So they show higher blood antibody levels to fungal pathogens such as Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Candida albicans, as well as something called soluble CD14, which is a protein marker of bacterial translocation. Um, some studies have even looked at the impact of psychotropic medications on these biomarkers and the levels of these antibodies to Saccharomyces cerevisiae are higher in patients with first episode psychosis who were naive to antipsychotics compared to those who were on antipsychotic treatments. So it's possible that translocation or a leaky gut can drive this pro-inflammatory state that can impact brain function. So we conducted one of the first studies to look at the gut microbiome across um, transdiagnostic disorders. And this was done as part of the American Gut Project, which is the world's largest citizen science crowdsourced and crowdfunded research uh, project on the gut microbiome that's hosted here at UC San Diego. And over 25,000 people have donated to this study. And from this larger repository, we identified about 1,000 adults who provided a fecal sample and who endorsed having been diagnosed with depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or PTSD. And so from there, we created this match sample and found that there was a significant community difference in the gut microbiomes of people who endorsed a mental illness compared to those who did not. And we repeated this analysis a couple of different times. We looked in just the US sample and as well as the UK sample, um, and we see the same difference. And the reason for splitting this analysis across country is important because we know that geography or where people live can have a major influence on the composition of the gut microbiome. We also found two different taxa, both belonging to the family uh, Ruminococcaceae, that distinguish patients from healthy controls. And this particular taxa has previously been reported in the literature to be associated with mental illness. 
and found to be reduced in patients with bipolar disorder and depression. So earlier, I mentioned that alpha diversity, or a measure of microbial richness or evenness within a sample, may be a marker of microbiome stability. And findings in patients with bipolar disorder have shown that this metric may be associated with different aspects of or clinical features associated with bipolar disease. So alpha diversity can fluctuate or may fluctuate across different mood states. Some studies have shown that in euthymia um, or compared to euthymia, patients with in an acute manic episode have higher alpha diversity compared to those in a current depressive episode who have lower alpha diversity. Lower alpha diversity has also been associated with longer durations of illness, as well as antipsychotic medication when compared to untreated patients. Lower alpha diversity in bipolar disorder has also been associated with decreased expression of a gene relevant to circadian rhythm and mood regulation. This clock gene under healthy conditions activates the breakdown of a neurotransmitter. So lower expression of this clock gene may lead to increased levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and noradrenaline with heightened activity triggering um, manic episodes potentially. In addition or in contrast to alpha diversity, there is a metric called beta diversity, which is a between samples measure, a between samples measure um, that shows how similar or dissimilar two pairs of samples are from one another. So results from beta diversity analyses across studies consistently indicate that the gut microbiomes in people with schizophrenia here on the left and bipolar here on the right are different in terms of their overall community structure and composition compared to healthy individuals. Both of these graphs are kind of similar to the microbiome map that I showed you earlier for the human body, except for instead of body sites, each dot represents a sample from either patients or healthy controls. Another study looked at patients with first episode psychosis, and they looked at whether or not people clustered closer to healthy controls here or further away from healthy controls. And they found that people who were clustered away from healthy controls had more negative symptoms and worse psychosocial functioning compared to people who clustered more similar to, similarly to healthy controls. The patients who clustered further away also had lower rates of disease remission at one year follow-up. So although we can pretty reliably draw conclusions that the general composition of the microbiome is altered in mental illness, the specific bacteria that are reported to drive these differences vary widely across studies. Our group has conducted a number of different systematic reviews of the gut microbiome in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, and we found almost over 100 different taxa that were reported to be different between these groups. So I think we're quite far from establishing specific signatures of different disorders or psychiatric illness in general. Um, but there were some standouts in terms of things that are taxa that were more commonly reported to be different. For example, Fecalibacterium and Ruminococcaceae are relatively less abundant and have been reported in multiple studies to be associated with better outcomes, like reduced depression or negative symptoms, better health and improved sleep. On the other hand, lactic acid bacteria are relatively more abundant in serious mental illnesses and have been shown to be associated with worse outcomes such as severity of psychotic symptoms, worse sleep quality, worse overall functioning, and increased levels of cortisol and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And I think this finding is a, a little bit puzzling because lactic acid bacteria, such as lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, have commonly been used in probiotics. 
So their reason for increased abundance in bipolar disorder and association with worse clinical outcomes is not yet understood. And it's something that we need to look into a little bit more. Antipsychotic treatment may also contribute to medical burden in bipolar disorder. Indeed, long-term use of antipsychotic has been associated with increased risk of weight gain, diabetes, and gastrointestinal disturbances. And the gut microbiome may underlie these metabolic changes with long-term use. In bipolar disorder, um, atypical a, a, a antipsychotic treatment has been shown to lead to increased level of lactospiracy, as well as higher levels of acromancia here on the graph on the left. Acromancia has also been shown to be present and have an increased or inverse relationship with inflammation, insulin resistance, and lipid metabolism. I'm sorry, let me, revert, let me repeat this. Non-treated patients have higher levels of acromancia, which is consistent with other findings showing that this particular bacteria is associated with less inflammation and less insulin resistance. Another longitudinal study found a different profile of microbes that were increased following treatment with quetiapine, uh, an atypical antipsychotic. And of these different bacteria, Colincella has also been detected in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, overall, I think that our current research has not yet been able to disentangle the effect of the microbiota on medications or due to medication effects versus the inherent effects of bipolar disorder. So further research really needs to be done to understand um, how some of these taxa may become useful predictors and outcomes. So I think that despite the progress that we've made such thus far, this field of research is still very, very young. And there are considerable limits to what we know and many research challenges that need to be overcome before we can have a strong grasp of the role of the microbiome in mental health disorders. Nevertheless, I think that there's great therapeutic potential in microbiome research. The modifiable nature of the human gut microbiome, unlike the human genome, makes it a particularly attractive option for the development of interventions. Studies like these have stimulated an interest in psychobiotics as potentially a new class of psychotropics. The term psychobiotics refers to any intervention that exerts an effect on the brain that's mediated by the gut microbiome. And I think initially it was used in reference to prebiotics or probiotics, but its definition has recently been expanded to include dietary interventions, fecal matter transplantation, and other treatments that may be capable of altering gut composition with an effect on mood, cognition, or other symptoms. So I'll briefly review some of these potential psychobiotics to get everyone thinking about ways in which we can actually manipulate the microbiome. But probiotics are supplements or foods that contain live microorganisms that alter the microbiome and can confer a health benefit. So live lactobacillus and bifidobacterium cultures are found in fermented foods such as pickled vegetable, kimchi, tempeh, and yogurt. And these strains of bacteria have the potential to produce GABA, serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, neurotransmitter systems that are implicated in major mood disorders. Prebiotics, on the other hand, are non-digestible foods or supplements that selectively stimulate growth and activity of indigenous bacteria in our guts. So you can think of prebiotics as preceding probiotics. The main dietary source of prebiotics are indigestible carbohydrate fibers and oligosaccharides, which are found at high levels in plant-based foods and human breast milk. Prebiotics are fermented by bacteria in the gut, and they lead to increased production of short-chain fatty acids, which have numerous health-promoting effects on the body, including reducing inflammation. 
there have been a number of clinical trials of these psychobiotics in psychiatric disorders. Probiotics have been reported to improve depressive symptoms and insulin metabolism in patients with major depression, as well as improve cognition and reduce hospitalization rates following acute mania and bipolar disorder. Similarly, interventions in schizophrenia have reported improved bowel function, reduced levels of intestinal inflammation, and increased levels of immunomodulatory proteins. A few trials of prebiotics in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia have shown increases in bifidobacterium species, which are probiotic species. However, I always caution that there are major limitations to the current studies. And I think overall, the research is still pretty conclusive. Most of these studies were conducted as open label or single arm treatment studies without a non-treatment control group. Although there were a handful of randomized clinical trials. And many of these studies actually didn't measure changes to the gut microbiome following probiotic administration. So I think that the jury is still out. I'm very excited about this area of research because I think it could pave the way for very novel diagnostic and treatment tools. But I think we need to take the research with a grain of salt at this time and make sure that we do our due diligence in, in understanding this well before uh, widely recommending or promoting these as potential treatments uh, for psychiatric disorders. I also think it's important to touch upon diet a little bit. We know that um, the Western diet um, has been associated with an inflammatory environment in the gut, characterized by overgrowth of pro-inflammatory bacteria such as E. coli, and decreases in more protective bacteria and positive healthy um, short-chain fatty acids. On the other hand, plant-based and Mediterranean diets, or those that are uh, rich in foods with omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants, are shown to reduce gut-related inflammation. At this time, the exact, associate, the exact association between diet and mental health in the gut microbiome is less well understood. Um, to date, there haven't been any studies that have investigated the effect of a dietary intervention on the gut microbiome in mental illness. But I think it's an important area of interest and one that needs more research. And of course, I can't talk about the gut microbiome with at least mentioning fecal matter transplantation. So fecal transplants are a treatment to restore a dysbiotic microbiome through administration of a complete microbiome from a healthy donor. And this treatment has been successful in treating well, lapsing Clostridium dif difficile infection that I mentioned earlier. Um, this has been investigated in a number of other populations, but it's not a widespread treatment yet for other disorders. There have been a few trials investigating fecal transplants um, on mental health related outcomes. So this particular study looked at patients with functional gastrointestinal disorders, and they found that fecal transplant led to increased alpha diversity of the gut microbiome. In addition to, and that increase in alpha diversity was associated with an improvement in depression scores. Um, this study here is quite impressive, actually. It was done in children with autism spectrum disorders, and fecal transplant led to an improvement in a number of different um, gastrointestinal symptoms, as well as behavioral symptoms of autism, including repetitive motor behaviors, communication, daily living skills, and socialization. They followed these children two years later and found that autism symptoms continued to improve without any other treatment. And the severity of symptoms at two-year follow-up was 50% lower than at baseline. So I've talked a lot about the bottom-up effect of the gut microbiome on behavior, but what about the other way around? Could changing behavior potentially alter the microbiome and improve gut health? 
And we don't exactly know the answer to that yet because no study to my knowledge has, so f has investigated the effect of psychological interventions on microbiome composition. However, we do know that psychosocial interventions, especially cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based interventions can improve functioning of the immune system. There have been a couple preliminary studies that have found that the gut microbiome can predict response to cognitive behavioral therapy. That people who had a particular type of community structure responded differently. And that those who did respond to cognitive behavioral therapy had higher baseline levels of fecal serotonin compared to those who did not respond. So these findings suggest that the conversation might go both ways. It's not just microbes talking to the brain, but the brain has a big part in the conversation as well. So that's all I have for my presentation today. I want to thank all of you for your time and attention. And I hope that I've left just barely enough time to answer some of the questions that you might have. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I know that this was such interesting and really valuable knowledge for our community. So thank you so much. We do only have a few minutes for questions. But you know, your presentation was so thorough that most of the questions that were asked got answered throughout. So we do only have um, just about one question right now. And you know, with all of this information, I know you said that there's a lot that you still don't know and that there are challenges around all of this research. So what are your next steps? What research is your team planning on conducting next um, in relationship to the gut, micro gut microbiome and mental illness? Yeah, so I think that's a good one. I think right now there's a lot of excitement. Um, and while I, I did emphasize and talk about intervention, then that's where my heart lies, in fact, is I would like to be able to develop interventions that target the gut to improve physical health as well as mental health, this idea of whole body therapeutics, so to speak. But I really think that before we can get there, one of the major questions we need to answer is how. And how is that happening? What are the mechanisms? So I think my next steps are really trying to understand what are the specific pathways? We know that there's an altered gut microbiome environment, but what are the downstream effects of the gut microbiome and how it may relate to some of these medical disorders or cognitive disorders? So is it through inflammation? Is it through oxidative stress? What are some of the pathways? And so learning a little bit more about the specific biology behind it so that we can more effectively tailor our treatments. Uh, I think it's, it's easy to kind of throw a bunch of probiotics at someone and say, well, I hope this helps. But I think we can be more precise in, in, in the fancy word now is precision medicine, is understanding where these targets should be focused so that we can tailor our interventions more effectively for people with different subtypes of the disorder. We know that bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression is so heterogeneous. And so can we um, supplement or do something above and beyond what current treatments are already providing? Thank you. That sounds all really exciting and I'm um, eager to you know, one day see what you discover. Um, and it's just great to know that there are so many different ways that you can you know, treat mental health with the gut. And I know that it's also interconnected. So it really is just such an exciting topic. So that is all the time we have today. Um, for questions. If you do have any additional follow-up questions, feel free to email me at info at ibpf.org and I'll be happy to pass them along. So thank you again, Dr. Wen, for such a wonderful um, presentation to allow our community to know more about the research that you have been um, conducting. So this webinar will be available on our website, our YouTube channel, as well as our Facebook. So I invite you all to review it um, if you want to share it with others as well. I also invite you to visit www.ibpf.org to learn more about our upcoming webinars 
and stay connected via our monthly e-newsletter where this recording will be featured. So we thank you for attending and we wish you all a wonderful week. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Bye, you guys. Bye.